Okay, recording is going. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. Like I mentioned, in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and stick with the schedule and get started. This is the webinar, Implementing a Comprehensive Tobacco Policy for Your Workplace. A couple housekeeping, housekeeping items, feel free to type your questions in the chat and we will save them for the end. So we'll present from about 1 to 1.30 and we have a few polls in there. And then we'll do Q&A from 1.30 to 1.45. And we're happy to stick around if you have additional questions. And then we can also be contacted um, afterward as well. We'll provide our email and we have a um, you know, phone number you can reach us as well. I do want to note that this is a Healthy Estate Initiative endorsed event. Um, that's because having a tobacco-free policy can help organizations become Healthy Estate designated. So it's really nice to be able to collaborate and kind of make that connection for everyone. At this time, I'd like to introduce our two speakers. So I'll give you both of their introductions at the beginning and then Josie will present first and Beth will present second. So Josie Redmond is a graduate from Iowa State. She has her bachelor's in science and kinesiology and health with an exercise science emphasis. She then pursued a master's degree in healthcare administration from DMU and she graduated in 2018. She's worked for this organization for three years and is a health promotion specialist. She's also a certified tobacco treatment specialist and trained freedom from smoking facilitator, as well as in-depth facilitator. Her favorite hobby is gardening. So she likes to have anything to do with plants indoors or outdoors. And then Beth Turner is our second speaker. And she's a graduate from the University of Iowa with a master of arts in health and sports studies with an emphasis in health promotion. She joined um, the team in February of 2013. She's our fearless leader as the director of health promotions. She's a certified health education specialist and a certified tobacco treatment specialist, along with being a trained freedom from smoking facilitator and not on tobacco facilitator. In her spare time, she likes to teach hot bar and yoga. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, uh, Ms. Redmond. Thanks for the introduction, Alyssa. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, so my name is Josie and like Alyssa mentioned, I've been with the American Lung Association for over three years as a health promotion specialist working on a tobacco grant funded by the Iowa Department of Public Health. I currently serve Polk, Warren and Madison counties, but additionally my coworkers serve Adair, Dallas, Jasper, Marshall and Union counties. Today, this webinar will provide general tobacco information, as well as the benefits of a comprehensive tobacco and nicotine free workplace. In today's presentation, we will cover all tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, the different types of exposure, including secondhand smoke, thirdhand smoke, and secondhand aerosol, reasons to consider implementing tobacco free and nicotine free environments, how to implement a strong, comprehensive tobacco and nicotine free policy at your workplace. And lastly, resources available to help individuals quit when they are ready. The American Lung Association in Iowa serves as a community partner for the Iowa Department of Public Health Division of Tobacco Use Prevention and Control Grant. The map on the right here shows all seven counties that we serve highlighted in green. However, the Tobacco and Nicotine Free Work Sites is a statewide initiative. If you are not in one of our counties, feel free to use this link over on the left to figure out who your local community partner is, or feel free to send us an email and we will be more than happy to connect to you. Now let's go ahead and examine the definitions of different tobacco products. A tobacco product is defined as any product made or derived from tobacco or that contains nicotine that is intended for human consumption or is likely to be consumed, whether it's smoked, heated, chewed, absorbed, dissolved, inhaled, or ingested by any other means. This definition does not extend to nicotine products approved by the FDA for tobacco cessation. Our definitions are comprehensive, which means that all tobacco products are covered and include all products that have not hit the shelves or market yet. Um, here are some examples of tobacco products. Starting with picture number one, you can see combustible cigarettes. Picture number two is Swisher Sweets Blunts. Uh, picture number three is a newer product called Heat Not Burn, um, which is called Icos. Picture number four is a hookah device. 
Picture number five is chewing tobacco. Um, both pictures six and seven are snus, which is loose tobacco that does not require spitting. And then picture number eight are flavored cigars. Uh, let's take a closer look now at electronic smoking devices. Um, so an electronic smoking device is an umbrella term that is used to describe a variety of electronic devices that almost always contain nicotine, flavorings, and other additives, and oftentimes simulate smoking. There are a variety of these products on the market, and they contain cancer-causing chemicals and heavy metals. In addition, these devices are highly customizable and mimic the behavior of smoking. Uh, the tobacco industry uses the term water vapor to make people think that they are somewhat safe, when in fact it's actually an aerosol that is released from these products once that e-liquid is heated. Um, however, the impact around um, which the American Lung Association is most concerned for both youth and adults is the impact of inhaling these chemicals and their impact on the lung. Um, so here are some pictures of some different electronic smoking devices. Um, so along with the harmful and cancer-causing chemicals these products contain, accidents have occurred due to the fact that all of these devices are battery powered. Uh, there have been reports of these batteries exploding while on the charger, resulting in injury, burns, or even death. Uh, this is due to the battery overheating or malfunctioning. I'm sure you guys have seen this type of stuff on the news, um, but from 2015 to 2017, there were estimated to be over 2,000 e-cigarette battery burn injuries. So let's move on and talk about secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoke is the smoke that's produced from burning tobacco products such as cigarettes, cigars, hookah, and pipe tobacco. It is also the smoke that is exhaled by the person using the tobacco product. Mainstream smoke is directly inhaled and exhaled by smokers from tobacco products. Sidestream smoke is smoke that goes into the air from burning a combustible tobacco product. So this may come up in your workplace if the work takes place outdoors, if there are designated smoking areas on the property, if people smoke in their cars in the parking lot with the window down, or if people smoke near entrances and customers and employees have to walk through that cloud of smoke in order to enter the building. We know that secondhand smoke contains over 7,000 chemicals. Um, several of these chemicals are toxic to our bodies, including 70 known chemicals um, that are known to cause cancer. Uh, Non-smokers and youth who are exposed to secondhand smoke breathe in these same dangerous chemicals that the person using the product inhales. Third hand smoke is the residue and chemicals left on indoor surfaces even after the smoking has stopped. So third hand smoke clings to hair, skin, and soft surfaces such as clothing, bedding, furniture, carpet, drapes, walls, um, and, and, other, and other items. Third hand smoke is comprised of over 250 chemicals. And this issue comes up in the workplace when employees can smoke during work time at a designated smoking area where they then return into the workplace with that third hand smoke left on their clothing. Exposure also occurs when you touch a contaminated surface or when you breathe in the gases that are produced from the surface itself. So we know that infants, young children, pets, and non-smokers are at an increased risk of exposure to third hand smoke because they are likely to touch a contaminated surface, uh, put a contaminated surface in their mouth, and spend more time on the floor or pulling up on the furniture. Like secondhand smoke, the aerosol produced from e-cigarettes is also harmful to the user. As you can see in this picture, um, with that aerosol cloud, you can see that e-cigarette secondhand aerosol is composed of the same harmful chemicals, including heavy metals, flavorings linked to lung disease, and several cancer-causing chemicals. We're particularly concerned about the impact of these harmful chemicals on the lungs and on the brain. So far in this presentation, we have defined tobacco products as well as second and third-hand smoke and second-hand aerosol. The remainder of this presentation will focus on tobacco and nicotine-free environments 
and how to either implement a policy or enhance a policy for your work site. The American Lung Association has a model policy that we are more than happy to share with you that you can implement, or we can take a look at your current policy and see if anything needs to be added for it to be comprehensive. We provide free technical assistance that includes assisting you in writing a policy that works best for your business, as well as free resources and incentive items, signage, ed education for your employees, and free advertising. Um, so a lot of people ask, why is it important for work sites to be smoke free 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Um, and it's important because like we talked about, it protects employees and customers from second and third hand smoke. Also, um, it motivates tobacco, tobacco users to quit if they're interested in quitting. Um, other people ask, why not just have a smoke-free policy? So a tobacco and nicotine-free policy protects everyone from second and third hand aerosol of electronic smoking devices. Um, this policy also encour encourages current users to quit instead of simply just switching to another tobacco product. Uh, so talking about the Iowa Smoke Free Air Act, uh, so the comprehensive tobacco and nicotine free policy that I'm talking about and that Beth will soon be talking about is stronger than the one described by the Iowa Smoke Free Air Act. Um, I'm sure you all are familiar with the Iowa Smer Smoke Free Air Act that went into effect on July 1st, 2008. Um, this prohibits smoking in enclosed areas within places of employment, as well as some outdoor areas. However, the Iowa Smoke Free Air Act also does not apply to electronic smoking devices. I am now going to turn things over to Beth and let her continue to talk about the importance of implementing a tobacco and nicotine free policy at your workplace. Awesome. Thank you so much, Josie. And I'm going to take us through. We have a nice background for tobacco products, what they look like, and really why it's important to implement a policy. And now I'm gonna make the step and the bridge to talking about what that actually looks like. So to just get a better gauge for us, we're gonna launch a poll. So I'll launch it here on the screen and you'll see some options for how confident are you in implementing a tobacco and nicotine free policy at your workplace? So feel free to submit your answers there. Give it just a little more time. Okay, perfect. So we have a lot of confidence, which is great um, to see that a lot of you are very confident, but it also we have some differing levels. So it's great to get a refresher. And also hopefully by the time we move through some of these slides, you can move from not confident or somewhat confident to very confident by the end. So taking a look at some of the making the case arguments for a tobacco and nicotine free policy. Really there's several reasons implementing a comprehensive policy is beneficial for both the employees and the employers. Reason number one is updating existing smoke-free policies. Like Josie mentioned, the Smoke-Free Air Act has some gaps and it's important for businesses to cover implementing a policy that is stronger than local state law, or in this case, the Smoke-Free Air Act. There's a lot of gaps that leaves coverage in areas where tobacco use is prohibited, along with the specifics that just combustible tobacco products are prohibited. Reason number two is to improve the health of all employees and visitors. This reason is important for all of us, knowing the detrimental effects of tobacco use. A comprehensive policy really promotes clean air for all who breathe it, removes the potential exposure to secondhand smoke that Josie mentioned earlier, and creates an overall healthier campus. In some instances, individuals may not enjoy outside features of a business like common areas due to tobacco use being allowed on the property. And then reason number three is reducing employer costs. We'll break this down a little more specifically later, but thinking about breaks, productivity, and healthcare costs, these costs all add up for businesses and are really significant. 
So reason number one, updating smoke-free policies. Tobacco and nicotine-free policies are really a priority because employees that smoke may replace cigarettes or combustible tobacco products with other non-FDA approved nicotine products during times when smoking is not prohibited. So an example of this would be if e-cigarettes are not prohibited in the company policy, employees may freely use these products in office or externally on the grounds rather than smoking or quitting tobacco. We really want individuals to quit and not switch products. It can also create confusion amongst a workplace if gaps exist for what is and is not allowable on the property. It's best to have a comprehensive approach that is very clear and uniform policy where all products are not allowed rather than some are and some are not. So reason number two is the second case to improve health of all employees and visitors. The current adult tobacco use rate in Iowa sits at 15.8%, and this is higher actually than the national rate of 14%. We have come a long way in terms of tobacco use by decreasing individuals who use these products, but really have so much further to go and making sure a policy like this helps set people up for success and reduce tobacco use rates. A couple of things to point out is smoking is the leading cause of preventable death and disease worldwide. And we see nearly one out of five deaths each year due to tobacco related conditions. And you can see other stats for lung cancer and also secondhand smoke exposure in non-smokers and one in 10 people with lung disease have never smoked. And smoking kills more people than alcohol, AIDS, car crashes, illegal drug murders, and suicides combined. And thousands more die from other tobacco-related causes, such as fires caused by smoking, um, which is actually more than 1,000 deaths year national -wide. Na nationally. Excuse me. Next slide. A comprehensive policy also is significant to impact the work environment and the experience for employees. So we see that it creates a safe and healthy work environment. It also demonstrates that the company cares about employee health and it's a priority. It also ensures that workers are protected from secondhand smoke and it is motivating to help tobacco users quit. We actually see that nearly 70% of tobacco users want to quit. And an environment that eliminates the triggers helps increase the chances of someone quitting successfully. If someone is trying to quit, they may find outlets such as going for a walk or sitting outside to combat cravings. But if they have to go through a walk through a smoking area or individual smoking, they may relapse in their quit attempt or not follow through. A comprehensive policy can really create one element of a supportive environment for those who are looking to quit tobacco. The third case is reducing employer costs. So we see approximately smokers miss about 2.6 more days of work than their non-smoking counterparts each year. It's also important to note that while every person is different, a study estimated that an average smoker takes two 15 minute smoke breaks per day in excess of regularly scheduled and allowed breaks. So we see around 5.5 missed time due to these breaks. Also a tobacco user can start to feel withdrawal symptoms about 30 minutes of their last cigarette or tobacco use of a product. It is these withdrawal symptoms that really can interfere with an employee's ability to effectively perform. So we also see productivity losses due to smoking, which we see about 1% less productivity than non-smokers, which results in about 2.6 days of lost productivity. And lastly, a study estimated that the healthcare expenses of a smoker is approximately 8% higher than the expense for a non-smoker. And they are more likely to have insurance claims, and could require employees and employers to pay higher premiums. So here's a chart to demonstrate some of those costs that we talked about relating to productivity in the workplace and breaks. A recent study found that for every smoker that quits, an employer can save between about $3,000 and $10,000 annually. 
And for each employee that quits using tobacco, there is an average cost savings of about $5,800 annually. So really significant cost that can be saved through helping and supporting tobacco users to quit through a comprehensive policy. The changes that are seen in the cost savings are in the ways that we talked about on the last slide. We see increased productivity, decreased sick days, decreased healthcare expenses, and also potentially pension benefits. And there are really many reasons to implement tobacco-free policy. And here's a list from the flip side of benefits that are very specific to an employer. Some of these we've also mentioned of creating a positive image, direct healthcare expenses can be reduced, workers' compensation claims, resale of businesses or buildings, and potential to negotiate lower healthcare costs. So next we are going to really talk about the nuts and bolts between implementing a tobacco free policy and a compre comprehensive one at that. So there's lots of reasons to consider implementing a policy for your work site. We have upgrading smoke free policies, improving the health of your employees and saving you money in the long run. And if a tobacco free worksite policy is right for your business and your employees, it's really time to begin looking at the planning steps and how to start this process overall. So we know how a tobacco and nicotine policy will benefit in the long run. Really the big question is how do we go about this policy change? And luckily that's where the American Lung Association can provide technical assistance to organizations and businesses that are looking to implement a policy or update their current policy. One of a big question that we get a lot of times is when this, should this policy take place and how? Um, it really comes down to a few steps and a deta detailed timeline, which we'll go over. We can work with individual businesses to create a specific timeline and to address your specific needs. Every worksite is really different in this aspect and has different needs. So we're able to shift and work with each worksite specifically to give you the best results and the best timeline for you. The first step overall is to take after you've decided to move forward with a policy is to determine the messaging that you will wanna be utilizing and an implementation date. So setting some of these standards, especially with the implementation date and working backwards. If you're still unsure about a policy or maybe don't have leadership buy-in, one idea that you could do is conducting a survey for employees to learn more about the support of a policy or any concerns they may have with a policy. This also could be a great tactic if maybe you already have decided to move forward with a policy at a management level, but want to increase employee buy-in and participation in the process. A great way to do this is surveying employees and have them be at the table. And after determining your messaging, working to determine a timeline that you can work with. And this could be where you could develop a committee or a work group to help with all of these steps. Development messaging, setting a date, creating a work group are all great ways to start. And work group can include members of HR, operations, current and former tobacco users, wellness, et cetera. It's great to have various levels of the organization be at the table if this is something your work site wants to look at with a group. Other steps to consider in this phase are health insurance coverage of FDA approved cessation medications. The Affordable Care Act mandates that most health insurance plans cover preventable services and tobacco cessation intervention is defined as a preventative service. This includes tobacco use screening and at least two cessation attempts per year, which includes counseling sessions and a treatment regimen. So we see that these mandatory conditions are a great way that can also support employees and quitting. Employers knowing their medication coverage is also important to guide them on their quit journey. If they're aware of their medication benefits and the medications that are available to them and what cost and copay they have, it's creating a clear plan for them to access these benefits and be more successful. 
So looking at the implementation process, a significant piece of the implementation process includes providing employee education on what the policy entails and when it will take effect. We cannot really stress enough how important this piece is to educate employees, customers, visitors, vendors. This can be accomplished via mailings, maybe it's postcard, flyer letters, or a portal that you use for employees. You can send if it's vendors, letters, however you communicate with them, as well as including this in new hire packages. Also letting the community know is a good idea or neighboring businesses. So if they have people coming onto their properties to smoke, they'll have communication open with you that you can address the issues. Letting the community know about the policy change is important as well. Maybe posting an article in a local newspaper, and this information should be communicated often and in different arenas. It must be clear to all employees and visitors what the policy cover to lessen violations of the policy itself. It should also be communicated what expectations are for the employees. Do you want the employees to report violations to HR? Do they ask people who are using tobacco products on campus to please refrain? FAQ documents is a great place to be clear to employees and managers on their roles for the policy. So here are just some steps that you can take, especially with thinking about removing huts and smoking areas, hanging up signage, which we have a nice example for you here, and we'll talk a little bit more about in the next slides. But along with these steps, cessation information and programs available should be provided to employees to give them time to work towards quitting before the policy takes into effect. Um, really trying to set them up with success for the policy rather than seeing it as a punishment for being a tobacco user. So clear communication, timely communication, and giving your employees the chance with supportive services, medications that are covered by insurance to help them quit. Also, we have the... I. I spoke about removing smoking huts and ashtrays. You'll really want to make sure to take these off of your property because having them visualize gives the impression that it is acceptable to use tobacco on the property because those items are available. After the communication phase, it's time for implementation. So working towards that implementation date that you set early on in the process. Some businesses may find that in implementation day kickoff party or hosting an on-site event, a celebration to help gain employee buy-in and to celebrate the policy change. Maybe a time where people who are trying to quit also receive resources. Maybe their spouses receive resources and supportive services. It's really up to the work site what fits best with you and works within your organization. And after the policy has taken effect, it's really important to evaluate and check in how things are going. A few ways to do this are on the slide here. So conducting employee follow-up, um, conducting an, an environmental follow-up. So maybe if you've noticed litter significantly before on the property, maybe seeing what the litter looks like, excuse me, after a policy. Next slide. So looking at the components of a gold standard policy, we're really, like I said earlier, happy to assist in writing or adapting your current policy to fit the components of a gold standard policy. You can see this checklist on the left-hand side are all the elements that should be in a comprehensive tobacco and nicotine free policy. And if a policy meets these gold standards, they're eligible to qualify for free metal signage and clings that we had pictures of in the previous slide. Um, and these standards are the Iowa Department of Public Health's gold standard that meets the requirements for a comprehensive tobacco and nicotine free policy. And we can help ensure that all of these elements get into your policy specifically. We also have a sample toolkit. We know this is a ton of information at once, lots of moving pieces and parts. So we have a lot of this information in a toolkit that we're happy to send you electronically. 
It has a policy implementation timeline example, really step-by-step -step guidelines, sample communication pieces, comprehensive policy examples, and it has imagery for the signage as well. Uh, again, we're happy to help for adjusting policies to your workplace. We really want to take the work out for you and bring to the table our expertise in what would fit best with a policy, examples of press releases, examples of social media communication. We have all these resources at our fingertips to provide you to make this simple, easy, and seamless. Again, I've mentioned all of these elements that we can provide you, and it's important to note that we've said, you know, free resources throughout this, and all of our services are at no cost. Um, handouts, educational materials, free signage if you have a comprehensive policy, all this is available for you. Looking at quickly, talking about resources available to support quit attempts in Iowa. So we had mentioned throughout this presentation that it's really important to set your employees up for success in this process, providing them what their insurance coverage is, as well as helpful programs that are free that you could utilize within your workplace. I mentioned before that nearly 70% of adult smokers are interested in quitting, which may surprise some of you or may not surprise some of you. In tobacco cessation programs offered at work sites as part of a comprehensive tobacco-free policy can help tobacco users really achieve this goal. It's also important to remember that tobacco users are addicted to nicotine and nicotine and tobacco use is an addiction. That's very important to remember, and it's difficult to overcome. It may take employees several attempts to quit, but we need to make sure supportive services are in line with each time they try and quit. Sensitivity to the needs of the tobacco users is important as you provide resources to help them quit and moving through a change to a com comprehensive tobacco-free environment. A few cessation options we have available here in Iowa are listed on the screen, and we're going to go in a few a little more detail, but the American Lung Association sponsors the Quit Now Freedom From Smoking online social support community through the Inspire platform. Our online community members have a social outlet and provide warm welcomes, emotional support, and making the experience positive and friendly by sharing stories and empowering individuals. So that's one free outlet. We also have our helpline that is staffed with nurses and respiratory therapists to answer all lung health questions. And we're gonna take a closer look at Quitline Iowa and Freedom From Smoking in the next slides. So Quitline Iowa is a free tobacco cessation resource made available by the Iowa Department of Public Health. All Iowans can access this program and its services. They get a quick guide, which is an easy to use workbook that they can reference throughout their enrollment in Quitline Iowa. They also get a quick coach, which is a support and assistance coach that helps them create a quit plan and guides them in the quit process. And then quitting aids such as our FDA approved cessation medications are discussed with individuals to help aid them in their cessation attempt. Quitline Iowa also has a pregnancy specific program that offers additional calls and resources to pre and postpartum women. And on the previous slide, you, you saw the program My Life, My Quit, which is the teen-focused option of Quitline Iowa, which is a tobacco cessation program for individuals 13 to 17 years old. We also have the American Lung Association's Freedom From Smoking program, which is an in-person support group led by a trained facilitator. We also have an online option with Freedom From Smoking participants that is Freedom From Smoking Plus. Um, it has highly interactive sessions available on a desktop or smartphone, um, and it has engaging tools and activities that workplaces can put can, excuse me, can purchase a bundle and then give these memberships out to employees. So wanting to go over a couple of frequently asked questions. Um, so these may be things that have come up in previous 
implementation discussions or maybe something that you've thought of yourself, which we'll go through here on the next slide. So we always like to address some of these questions that people have and mention that an FAQ document is a really great thing to have throughout this process. So what if I rent commercial space? What if I'm located within another building or suite? And what if the employees are working remotely? These are all areas that can still have a comprehensive tobacco and nicotine free policy. And especially if you're located in a suite with another building, this could be a great way to engage other businesses to move together and implement a policy. And then it's something that you can include in a rental agreement if you own space or discuss with your landlord to implement a policy specifically. So we're gonna launch another poll just to kind of get a feel for what it looks like for how likely individuals are to reach out for tobacco policy and cessation support. So go ahead and give your answer on the screen here. I'll give a couple minutes. Perfect. Awesome. So we have very likely, not likely, and not sure for the answers. So that's great that we have a lot of interest in resources. As we mentioned, all these resources are free and we're happy to provide you um, anything you're looking for, whether it be brochures, just a conversation and whatnot. And also remembering that while we may not be in your service area, you're actually able to receive these same services no matter what county in Iowa you are located in. And lastly, looking at, that's our nice little <laughs> breath logo along with our newly branded logo, is we have one last question before we jump into the Q&A, is the likelihood that you will implement a policy at your workplace? So again, just kind of gauging where you're at, maybe you already have a policy in place to give us a better idea of what we can provide. Perfect. So we kind of have a variety of options, which is great. So about 30% very likely and 30% about in the middle, not very likely about 14% and already having a policy in place. So again, we're here to provide support at whatever level you're at. Maybe it's not very likely and just need to start the conversation phase to move to maybe neither likely nor unlikely or moving from neither likely to very likely. We're able to provide so many levels of support for what you need and maybe a policy is not the right time right now, but in a few years it will be. Whatever stage you're at, we're here and we're happy to help. So we know this is a lot of information for everyone, but we're gonna jump into a little Q&A. So if you all have any questions about the process, programs, any question you have for us, feel free to type it in the chat, or if you're wanting to come off mute, feel free and we can answer some of your questions. Anyone have any questions for us? We always like to leave the time and space. We have a Thank couple you. coming in. Great. I'm going to chime in. Can you go back to the slide with the email address list listed? And then we will also be able to send out, I do see we have a question, but while I'm thinking of it, we'll be able to send out this recording um, with our additional resources as well. 
So the one I'm reading is, how have you helped employers in the construction industry successfully implement a policy? Um, I will jump in with um, supporting Turner Construction several years ago implemented. And uh, I think they may have merged since then, but they were able, they were, okay. So we went to a health fair to provide cessation resources as they were going through this change. And just anecdotally, several employees came up to me and just said, thank you. And that they're so glad that their business did this because they had been wanting to quit, but it was just too easy for them to kind of smoke on autopilot on quick breaks and while they were doing their job. And so they were able to um, remove that barrier, remove that temptation and remove that trigger. And so they found it really helpful anecdotally and were able to give me that guidance um, kind of after the decision had already been made. But I would say the company started with a survey to try to put some feelers out there about what the current culture was among employees and how it would go over with employees. And that really gave them their answer. So once they saw, oh, there's actually a lot of support for it. And, oh, we were worried there'd be a lot more, um, you know, negative things to say about the policy. And we're really seeing positive support for it and that the people who don't use tobacco are in favor because then they're not exposed to the secondhand smoke or the aerosol. And then the tobacco users who are kind of on the fence about quitting again saw this as an opportunity to really make the decision for them. So I would say the first step in the construction industry or industries where it may be what you might perceive as more challenging is that doing a survey to kind of gauge what the actual employees think is a really good first step to take. And then I think too, also thinking that, you know, there may be some instances where going straight to a comprehensive tobacco and nicotine free policy isn't realistic for an organization. So there's always tiers and steps you can take with that being your ultimate goal. Could be something that, you know, maybe it's specific designated areas to start. Um, and then moving through stages to make it at that comprehensive level. Um, we've helped organizations move from a smoke-free policy on the grounds to then working with a tobacco-free comprehensive policy. So there's lots of different levels to start off with. Um, and just having that be your ultimate goal, I think, is something to think about, too. To add to that, um, I like the talk about different levels. So another organization in that industry, we assisted by having them implement a tobacco and nicotine free policy at their corporate location. Um, and then they, they have the long term plan to move it to the job sites. And this is because they wanted to be able to show that they were walking the walk. And I will say they did have people in leadership that were tobacco users. Um, and so that was a big change just for the corporate building, but that is where they started. Thanks for asking that question. I think there are a lot of different industries where there are higher tobacco use rates and there may be um, more barriers to changing. And so I think that's a great question to pose for the group. We are at 1.43. We have a couple minutes of designated time left to and does anyone else have any other questions that they'd like to come off of mute or type in the chat? Feel free, we'll, we'll hold on for a couple minutes here. It can be helpful adding to this also to find a champion. So if there's someone within the organization that recently quit and they're really, really proud of it and they want to use that momentum, um, you can have them be a champion in organization for encouraging the change. Not hearing any more questions or seeing anything else in the chat, we will go ahead and wrap up today. Um, at 1.45. I want to thank everyone for spending your afternoon with us and for taking the time out of your day to, to join us. And we're looking forward to sending you the follow-up recording along with additional resources.
Again, please reach out to these email addresses or this phone number if you wanna get started or have any additional questions that pop up as you go to think about it a little more. Thank you very much and have a great day.